I'm going to introduce the next speaker and the final one for this session on serious sustainability, which is, uh, who is Michael Pollan. I mentioned earlier that one of my standards of, of uh, admiration when it comes to the world of writing is people who can take the synthetic view. Synthetic, not in the sense of false, but of combining things and allowing people to see them in, in, in a new way. Uh, I mentioned Jared Diamond's work in that connection. Although this is not directly on topic, I hope anybody here who has not yet read David Fromkin's book, A Peace to End All Peace, will read that book. It's a masterpiece of history of the Middle East from the Ottoman Empire, from the, from the end of World War I onward, showing uh, the world we, we deal with now. I mention this because Michael Pollan, who's a Knight Professor of Journalism at uh, UC Berkeley and a friend of mine from the days, from the years I was, was teaching there, is one of these writers. He, in his recent books, he's given people a different way to think about their own place in the food chain, the, the choices they make individually in consuming food and growing food and in, uh, preparing food and how this affects both their own lives and the whole larger web that we've been talking about today in these various uh, pre presentations. He's given people useful ways to think about serious sustainability. These books, of course, are in defense of food, which has come out recently, Omnivore's Dilemma, The Botany of Desire, and others. So please join me in welcoming Michael Pollan. Thank you, Jim. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to address my remarks today to, not directly to you, but uh, if it's okay, w to the uh, president-elect, who I wish were here in this room today, but... Um, so I want to address this to dear Mr. President-elect. You may be surprised to learn that an issue that you spoke of hardly at all during the campaign is going to occupy a great deal of your time over the next four or eight years. And that issue is food, in the American food chain. Two reasons for this. One is that food prices are rising and they're about to soar. There have been uh, a lot of uh, rising grain costs that have not been passed on to the consumer yet, they're about to be. And high food prices always create political peril, uh, as we know, we've known since the French Revolution at least. Uh, the era of cheap food is over in this country, just as the era of cheap oil is over. Uh, and it is over abroad as well. I'm not going to deal with the international implications because we're going to do that at a panel a little bit later. And the old fixes, which is to say ramping up production as fast as you can, are not going to work this time, because cheap food depends on cheap energy, something we can no longer count on. Um, and that fact points to a deeper reason that reform of the American food system will soon become imperative and an everyday concern of yours. Without it, without reforming the American food system, it will be impossible to make progress on the issues you did talk about during the campaign, a little. Energy independence, climate change, and the healthcare crisis. Why? Well, because the way we're feeding ourselves in this country is at the heart of all three problems, is the shadow problem behind all of those. Let me explain. Um, the food system, and by that I mean agriculture as well as food processing, uses more fossil fuel and contributes more greenhouse gas not just CO2, but methane and nitrous oxide, which are more serious in their ability to trap heat, to the atmosphere than any other industry, somewhere between, depending on the studies, 17 and 34 percent. Meat production alone, according to the UN, is 18 percent of the greenhouse gases. Now, how can this be? Well, as soon as farmers cut trees and plow the soil, they release a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But the 20th century industrialization of agriculture has increased this by an order of magnitude. The fertilizers that we depend on are made from natural gas. The pesticides that we depend on are made from petroleum. Processing and packaging use great amounts of fossil fuel. And of course, transportation. This whole regime, what I call industrial agriculture, has transformed the food system from one that was able to produce 2.3 calories of food energy for every single calorie of fossil fuel energy as recently as 1940 into a system that can only produce one calorie of food energy for every fossil fuel calorie 
at the farm level, but by the time it gets to the supermarket, it's 10 calories of fossil fuel energy for every single calorie of food. And when you get to something like beef, uh, the ratio is even worse. It's 55 calories of fossil fuel energy for every single calorie of food. When we eat from this modern food system, the one all of us eat from every day in this country, we are eating oil and spewing greenhouse gas. Which is really absurd when you think about it, because food is the original solar technology. Every calorie you have ever eaten, whether seafood or terrestrial food, began with photosynthesis with a chloroplast. Um, there is a great deal of hope in that very simple fact, and I'll return to it. Now, food, as I suggested, is also implicated in the health care crisis. Since 1960, uh, the percentage of national income spent on health care has gone from 5% to nearly 18% today. We won't be able to insure everyone unless we get these costs under control. Now, there are many reasons for this increase, but one of the biggest and I would argue most tractable, is the cost to the system of diet-related chronic diseases. Four of the top ten killers in America are diet-related chronic diseases, and in, in aggregate, they cost the system uh, in excess of $250 billion a year. Today, it costs New York City, the city of New York, $500,000 for every new case of type 2 diabetes and one in three children born in the year 2000 are predicted by the CDC to have to grapple with type 2 diabetes. Surely it's no coincidence that in that same period, since my boyhood, when health care costs were rising from 5 to 18 percent, spending on food as a percentage of national income was plummeting from 17 percent to 9.5 percent today. So this era of cheap food has cost us in many ways. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. The American people increasingly suggest, uh, suspect that the system is broken. They are very concerned about the provenance of their food, the safety of their food, uh, the welfare of the animals in their food system. Um, there is more political constituency, I think, for change in the food system than politicians have yet realized. Um, and we see in the marketplace that the market for alternatives, organic, pasture-based, local, uh, and all the others, is thriving today. The even better news is this. The same policies that will reduce agriculture's contribution to climate change and the energy crisis will also dramatically improve public health. We can make progress on all three fronts at once, make the system safer, more secure, and more sustainable, not only here in America, but in the developing world as well. What we won't be able to do again is ever make food as cheap as it has been or something we can ever take for granted again. Here's the core idea, and I'm going to speak in terms of proposals mostly uh, for the rest of my talk. We need to wean the American food system off its heavy 20th century diet of fossil fuel and put it back on a diet of contemporary sunshine. Easier said than done, I know. It will require changes at every link in the food chain, in the field, in the marketplace, and in the culture. Um, but it can be done, as long as photosynthesis still works. I want to briefly just uh, sketch how we got here. How did we take the solar system and put it on oil? Um, when you were a candidate, you flew many, many times over the state of Iowa, and you may have noticed something very peculiar about the landscape there. Between the months of October and April, the land is black. There is nothing growing. A spectacular waste of solar energy. Uh, go back 50 years, 60 years, and you would have seen a checkerboard of green. You would have seen uh, pastures for animals. You would have seen cover crops to fix nitrogen in the soil. But today, fertility is restored after that intensive growing season with fossil fuel fertilizer, which has eliminated the need to use photosynthesis to capture nitrogen and put it in the fields. Um, since World War II, our societies, our government's policies, has been toward maximizing production of a very few commodity crops, especially corn and soy, grown in vast monocultures underwritten by fossil fuel. These monocultures could not survive without it. They need the fertility, otherwise they would be exhausted, so oil remedies that problem, and they would be afflicted by insects, as monocultures invariably are, and they need pesticides to deal with that. 
Um, so, and this whole regime is really a legacy of World War II. The conversion of munitions to fertilizers that went on right after the war, and nerve gas research to pesticides. It has been said rightly that we are still eating the leftovers of World War II. Um, it's a very powerful regime, and I want to give it its credit. It is the reason, we need to acknowledge its achievement, it is the reason that an American can get, go into a McDonald's and get a bacon double cheeseburger, a large fries, and a supersized Coke for less than an hour's work at the minimum wage. In the long course of human history, that's an incredible achievement. And it's not something people are going to be eager to give up. It all is the result, though, of this cheap, subsidized grain uh, grown in these monocultures with fossil fuel. That's what makes possible the feedlot meat, the very cheap feedlot meat, the sweeteners, and the processed food. But the costs, the costs are very high. Monoculture in the fields leads to monoculture in the diet. Nearly a third of the calories in the American diet today consist of hydrogenated soy oil, which we know is lethal, and corn sweeteners, which we know are also lethal. These are the building blocks of fast food, and the reason they have been so cheap is because this is what we pay our farmers to grow in overproduction. This system also squanders oil and pollutes the atmosphere. Fossil fuel, of course, is what makes possible a national and a global system. It is the reason that, that Iowa can get by growing corn and soy and nothing else, uh, or that California can feed New York City instead of the Garden State, New Jersey, as they used to, or why Alaskan salmon is shipped to China to be filleted before it comes back here to be eaten or why America exports sugar cookies to Denmark and imports sugar cookies from Denmark. An odd trade that uh, an economist once said about, wouldn't it be more efficient to swap recipes? <laughs> Indeed. But the cheap fossil fuel system that made this make financial sense, these weird supply chains, is coming to an end. Um, a box of broccoli could be shipped from the Salinas Valley to the Hunts Point Market in New York a year ago for three bucks. It is now $10. The reason, with that in mind, some of the cleverest growers in this area uh, have started to buy cropland in New England. They are going to grow broccoli there. What a novel idea, a little closer to where it's consumed. You can grow broccoli anywhere. Um, these companies, these growers, recognize what we all will soon which is that we are simply going to have to squeeze the oil out of our food system. So how do we do it? Well, I'm going to very quickly take you through some proposals, and I'm going to be sketchy and elliptical about it, and, uh, uh, but I hope to plant some ideas with you. On the farm. Now, in nature, how do, how, which is productive year after year without fossil fuel, the key to fertility, renewing fertility, and the key to dealing with pests, of course, is biodiversity. These problems don't exist in nature. There are no monocultures in nature, and we need to learn to mimic those systems on the farm. The power of cleverly designed polycultures, growing many crops in complex rotations or in symbiosis between species, animal and plant, to produce lots of food from little more than soil, sunlight and water has been proven at many, many scales. At the scale of alternative farmers in this country, at the scale of very large uh, rice, fish, farmers in China, and at the scale of beef production in Argentina, where they grow in an eight-year rotation, or they did until high grain prices moved them all into soy, um, they um, would do five years of cattle on pasture, produce the best beef in the world, and then they could grow three years of grain without any fertilizer at all. And there were no weed pests either, because the weeds of pastures could not survive the weeds of, of row crops and vi vice versa. So this is a large-scale approach that has been proven, um, although it's endangered today, as I said, by the economy. Now, I need you to understand that the most sustainable agriculture is not your grandfather's farming. We are not talking about turning back the clock. It is based on the latest knowledge of ecology, entomology, and soil science. It involves complicating what fossil fuel made very simple. It is indeed post-industrial. And we, have, we need to come to understand that a smart crop rotation is as ingenious a technology as a genetically modified seed. We need to see it as such and support this research. I think the only reason we haven't is that is it a research that produces processes and not, sorry to say to all of you, products. 
It is mostly about processes, and it's very hard to make money off of a new process. Um, government heavily subsidized this shift to monoculture, and now it can do the opposite, needs to do the opposite, it's subsidized change. Very rough outline. We need to start revo rewarding farmers for diversification, for the number of days fields are green, for the number of crops they grow. We need to bring animals back onto farms. An enormous mistake was made. Uh, the, the elegant solution of the sun feeding grass and the grass feeding animals and the animals feeding us and the soil was, as Wendell Berry said, neatly divided into two problems. Um, a pollution problem on the feedlot, a fertility deficit on the farm made up for by fossil fuel. We need to begin subsidizing farmers, not by the bushel for what they produce, but for the ecological services they provide. For example, sequestering carbon. Um, you know, we have 700 million acres of cropland and rangeland, and if they are managed correctly, that could become the biggest carbon sink uh, in the country. Uh, so it's very important we, we include farming in any carbon trading scheme so that we penalize bad farming and reward good farming, because farmers can make a lot of money selling carbon credits if we include them in that scheme, if they do rotational grazing and, and other very important steps. We need a strategic grain reserve. Um, why? Just the, way, the same reason we have a strategic petroleum reserve. We need to be able to, to even out these swings in commodity prices, because very high prices and very low prices both force farmers to overproduce. So we need predictability on prices, and uh, just as we, you know, that we're trying to do with our petroleum reserve. Um, we need to put more farmers on the land. The hard part of this is not the amount of food you can produce per acre, it's the amount of food you can produce per farmer. And we only have a million or so farmers left. And I think that that really is the hard part. We need to train farmers. We need to recognize that the complex farmers who can do this kind of work are the green economy jobs that we're all talking about. We must number them in that program. And we need to preserve every acre of good farmland near the city, because we're going to need it. We're going to need that broccoli growing land near Manhattan. It may not be that New Jersey can ever feed New York City again, but it can help. And uh, in the same way we recognize the importance of preserving um, wetlands, and erected a very high bar to their development, we will need to do the same thing with every acre of good farmland. You will have to justify why you're going to plant a house on it. Um, so that, that's what we need to do at the farm level. Now, you're, you're probably saying, can we feed the world this way? And I can't give you a complete answer to that question. And in fact, the most honest answer is we do not know. We haven't tried. We've been trying something very different. But keep in mind a few things. Half of our cropland worldwide is going to feed animals. A quarter of the food grown in America is wasted. There is a lot of slack in this system. And we also have models of polycultures that are substantially more productive than simple monocultures. You know, in the case of climate change, we also don't know that we can run an industrial civilization without cheap fossil fuel. But we're going to try to find out, and we need to do the same thing in agriculture. Um, at the marketplace level, second level I want to briefly talk about, we need to re-regionalize the food system. Um, if you simply diversify farms and don't give them ways to sell their produce, it's not going to work. If the grain elevator says all we take are corn and soy, no one in Iowa is going to grow anything else. So we need to shorten the food chain. Decentralizing the food supply has many benefits besides saving fossil fuel. It is a matter of security. We understood after 9-11, the GAO studied the food system because there was great concern about its vulnerability to terrorism. And the conclusion was that we have such a highly centralized food system that it's very easy to contaminate it. And we've seen that when, uh, you know, contamination of uh, whether it's uh, lettuce in the, in the Central Valley, uh, you know, when you're washing the nation's entire salad in one big sink, you're going to communicate disease to a lot of people when you make a mistake. So a decentralized food system is more resilient to shocks. And I think one of the things we know is that the future is going to be very unpredictable. And we need to value resiliency and not just efficiency. Now, the market is driving this trend toward the relocalization of food, but right now the government is standing in the way and there's a lot the government can do. 
Uh, there is a, there's a thicket of regulations that makes it very hard for local food producers. Uh, you, you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars before you can smoke a ham and sell it in your, in your, in your community because of uh, food safety regulations designed to deal with very large players. Uh, we're running out of abattoirs, regional abattoirs. If we're going to bring animals back onto the farms, there have to be places to uh, slaughter them. And the fact is now four companies slaughter 84% of the beef, and they don't like little regional abattoirs, and they're closing them down. So the government has to support that uh, with mobile abattoirs. And we need to regionalize food procurement. The government should, in the same way we advance other important social goals by requiring that a certain percentage of uh, spending by the military or by schools uh, or by the park service, uh, we should make sure that a certain percentage is going to local food, food grown within 100 miles. Um, and lastly, we need to change the food culture because we are all implicated in this culture of fast, cheap, and easy food that is grown, processed, and moved around with fossil fuel. We need to learn to eat from a shorter, more local food chain. So how do you do that? Well, I'm sorry she's not here today. She was going to be, but uh, Alice Waters kind of had an idea here, and I think it's smart. We need to start with kids. 50 years ago, President Kennedy, concerned about the physical fitness of America, launched a program to improve it. And how did he do it? Well, he made physical education a required, a mandatory part of the school day. We need to do the same thing with lunch. We need to give them credit for lunch. We need to teach them the basics of growing, cooking, uh, growing and cooking food and then enjoying it at shared meals. It won't be cheap. It'll probably cost another dollar a day per student, but it will pay off in healthier students, better able to learn, reduced health care costs, and sturdier local food economies. We need to teach adults too. And one idea would be to put a second calorie count on every food package, on the nutrition label. So you can see how many food calories are there and how many fossil fuel calories are there. So you can see when you buy that hamburger that it's got 55 calories of fossil fuel in it. Carbon footprint is much more complex than food miles, but we can figure out a metric that will let consumers who care about this move their dollars toward uh, more solar-based food. And then, Mr. President-elect, there is, of course, the bully pup pulpit. There's a lot that the White House can do to set an example. Um, the choice of White House chef, and I would nominate Alice Waters for White House chef. Um, that chef can elevate the issue and shine a light on farmers and show how, to, how eating locally uh, grown food is not so hard as people think, and that well-prepared meals depend on well-grown, um, so sun-fed food. We also need a new post, White House farmer. And that farmer should have the authority to take the best five acres of the South Lawn and convert it to a garden. Five acres would, would feed the White House, and there would be plenty left over to feed lo offer food to local uh, banks. Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, planted a victory garden in the 40s. She did it over the objection of the USDA, who said she was going to louse up the, the, uh, the food economy. She did it anyway and helped spearhead this move toward victory gardens, uh, which are not trivial. They were 40 million of them, and they were growing 40% of the nation's produce from the shortest food chain of all. Gardening is not trivial. Um, a victory garden not only grows all that food and sequesters all that carbon if it's done right, it teaches the habits of mind and body we will need to navigate the uncertain waters ahead. It teaches self-sufficiency as well as interdependence, neighborliness. They help us get over, I think, the cheap energy mind, which is so specialized it leaves us feeling helpless to act in the face of climate change, looking to experts to solve our problems. Most of us can't imagine contributing directly and physically to our own support. Um, can't imagine with living, living with less fossil fuel. Best of all, I think, a garden reminds us just how much is given. Um, but the sun still does shine down on our yards, Photosynthesis does still work its wonders wherever it does. It reminds us that our res relationship to nature is not necessarily zero sum, that in fact there is a free lunch, and that is of course solar energy and photosynthesis. If there is any part of modern life that can be freed from its reliance on oil and resolarized, surely, surely it is our eating. Thank you very much.
Thank you.